Protectors of the Suna Suna Protectors of the Suna Study the subject and also went through quite a few benefits of uh, resulting in the studying Sierra. Okay, so what we're going to do today, we'll go through the quiz, uh, give you a chance to answer the questions. After the quiz, um, we'll have a class uh, with the next uh, set of topics for about 30, uh, maximum 40 minutes, something like that. Um, so we'll go straight to the quiz. All right, so the first question here, what is the meaning of the Arabic word Sarah? You can type the answers up on the screen, or you can use the mic. If you want to use the mic, just let me know and I'll enable your microphone. I want to use the mic. Travel or journey. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, so um, uh, Sarah means uh, the life of uh, or someone's biography. Um, Tariq is putty. The Arabic word Sarah means the biography of a person's life journey. Sister Laili means Sarah means to travel, to write about someone's life, uh, some person's life journey. Uh, the Sarah is the biography of a person's life. Sister Malyun, Sarah means to travel, the life and biography of the prophet. Uh, the biography of a person needs to travel, travel through a person's life journey. MashaAllah. Very good, lots of good answers there. And it means the biography of a person. Okay, so um, all very good answers. Uh, just about covers everything. Um, so base, essentially it's, um, it's a biography, a story of someone's life. So the language of the word Sarah, it comes from a verb meaning to travel. And uh, the biography of a person is called Sarah because when we read it, it's essentially like um, we are traveling that person's life journey as we learn about, you know, all the events that happened uh, during their lifetime. So when we study the life and times of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's as if we are following in his footsteps, traveling in his life journey. Um, and also talked about how it can refer to anyone's life story, but usually it, we take the word Sarah to mean the life and times of Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, mashallah, excellent answers there. All right, the next question here, true or false, studying the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, is optional. Studying the seerah of the Prophet is optional, true or false. Okay, mashallah, we've got good answers there, correct answers. And um, also got more detailed answers here. Sister Laili says it's false, it's not optional, it's an obligation upon every Muslim to study the... Uh, Tariq's put false, it's an obligation. Many verses of Quran mention our, our Prophet is the best example for us to follow. Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, you have a good example to follow for he who hopes that for the meeting with Allah on the last day and remembers Allah often. And uh, Sister Malun put, uh, Allah says, so I advise you uh, with one thing only, that you stand up for Allah's sake and peers or alone and you reflect on the life history of the Prophet. Yeah, so it's an obligation. Um, and yeah, so ma MashaAllah, very good answers. Uh, 
great job, uh, very detailed there. Um, because um, as, as mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us um, in, in, very, in uh, you know, quite a lot of verses, um, for example, وَأَطِيَ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ And follow Allah and his messenger. And, you know, many variations of that verse. Um, so I think mentioned yesterday something like about 50 times in the Quran, this same theme is repeated, just using slightly different words and contexts. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in many places in the whole Quran, whole Quran to take the Prophet as an example to follow, and you cannot follow him unless you have knowledge of him. So from the Sira, we can gain religious knowledge and uh, we can gain knowledge about manners and morals and all of that kind of thing um, and also we get to know how the leader, father a husband all, all of those roles that he fulfilled and whatever aspect of life we look at we find an example in him to follow wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'm going to go on to another question. Name some benefits in studying the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Name some benefits in studying the biography of the Prophet. Okay, so this is a long list we went through yesterday, uh, the day before. See if you can name some of those benefits. Okay, some of the answers here. Sister Sarah, increase your love to the Prophet. Help helps us understand the Quran. Uh, it's a source of optimism. Learning the Prophet's companions, develop the Muslim identity. Learning the history of Islam it helps increase our faith. Sister Laili, there are so many benefits. Uh, increases increases our knowledge of him and how to love him. The ability to learn about his companions, learn about the history of Islam, and help us understand the Quran and. So much more, of course, we obtain and learn how we should be in our manners, actions, and so on when it comes to everything in life. Also, gain religious knowledge needed in order to understand the Quran. Also, we learn more about the Prophet and grow. It helps us to grow in our love for him. Considered an act of worship, and one will be rewarded for doing so. Allah rewards us for getting to know the Prophet. These are all answers I'm reading off the screen you're putting here increases our love for the prophet and increases our understanding of our religion you develop love for the prophet get used to um you use his life to get through trials in life helps us understand the quran more and to develop muslim identity source of hope and inspiration and it helps us to love the prophet more develops a muslim identity and to be a better muslim okay mashallah good job Lots of people answering there, so um, yeah, pretty happy with that. Um, as we mentioned, being one of the benefits, increases our love for the Prophet. Just summarizing quickly, increases our love for the Prophet. The Sira helps us to understand the Quran. It's a source of optimism. The Sira itself is a miracle. Um, it's a precise way for the revival of the Ummah. Yeah, it helps us to be better people um it's a source of knowledge about the companions as well uh a source of knowledge about our islamic history it is a bada as mentioned in the answers and helps us to develop that muslim identity okay mashallah very good participation in uh, this quiz that's great uh, the next one, question four, true or false? It's highly recommended that we love Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. True or false? That we love Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, the answer's on the screen here. Um, the answer to this is false because it's not just recommended, but we're obligated to love the Prophet. And it serves as a completion of faith. True, we should love him more than we love ourselves. Very good answer. Uh, sorry, 
it's it's false because um, it's an obligation. And um, what else we've got here? Other answers are Sister Laley, false, it's not recommended. We love the prophet. It's an obligation to love him more than anything else. We must love him more than ourselves, our parents, our children. Okay, very good answer because this is um, quoting from the Hadith. Okay. Uh, another one there, Sister Sarah, false, it's an obligation to love the prophet. He said, none of you will attain true faith and so on. And um, this all comes up in the next answer as well. So I'm just going to skip over <laughs> reading some of these answers because it's answering the next question. So next question, question five. Our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, none of you will attain true faith until you love what? Complete the missing words. The Prophet وسلم, said, none of you will attain true faith until you love what? <clears throat> yep, correct answers here, Sister Sarah answers uh, until you love me, the Prophet. And uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, Sister Malun's answer, um, none of you will attain true faith until you love me. That's part of the hadith. See if you can get the rest of the hadith. I think that was in the previous answer. Oh, there it goes. Sister Yasmin has put more than your parents, your children, and all of mankind. Okay, so that's completing the hadith of the Prophet. Tariq put out, Prophet said, none of you will attain true faith until you love me more than your parents, your children, and all of mankind. Okay, so that's the correct answer. It's quoting the hadith. And Sister Laili, the same thing. Sister Om Al Hir, uh, same thing. And uh, Sister Om Ibrahim's family, uh, correct answer. Okay, mashallah, good job. So we'll uh, go on to the next one. Why did Amr ibn al As, radiallahu anhu, never look at the Prophet's face? Uh, never look at the Prophet face to face. Was it due to fear? shyness respect hypocrisy modesty love or hate why did amr ibn al-as who never look at the prophet face to face was it due to fear shyness respect hypocrisy modesty love or hate Okay, Jibril and family there, they put CNF, respect and love. Um, Sister Yasmin has put the same, respect and love. Um, Sister Laili's put a few extra ones in there. And Sister Awa has put... Um, love and respect the same answer okay so that they were the two i was looking for um out of love and respect because um if you remember the story we went through last time um he loved and respected him so much after he embraced islam and remember he was a disbeliever before who hated the Prophet وسلم, so much and wanted to kill him and all of that stuff. So we went through that in detail in the story last time. So he went through this huge transformation until he got to that point um, where his worst enemy, he became the most beloved person to him in the whole world. And he had such huge respect and love for him that he couldn't even look at his face. And if you were to ask him, he said, if you were to ask me what the prophet looked like, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't describe his face because I never looked at him directly. 
So that was the huge love and respect he had for him. Yeah, exactly. He respected him so much that he was shy to see his face. Alhamdulillah. So, good answer. Question seven, what does Islam erase? What does Islam erase? Okay, Sister Isra answers everything that was committed before. Sister Awa Awa answers Islam erases everything you did before in terms of sins. Sister Laili, Islam erases everything before it. Like if a person becomes a Muslim, all of his previous sins will be erased. Uh, Sister Sarah, Islam erases everything before it. Whatever you did wrong in the past would be erased. Sister Sawada, all past sins. And uh, Sister Om Ibrahim's family, it erases everything that came before it regarding sins committed. Sister Yasmin, Islam erases all the sins committed in the past. Okay, similar answers here. And uh, mashallah, they're all all good. Okay, so Islam <clears throat> Islam erases all of your sins from the past. And uh, Jamila, Sister Bint Muhammad, everything before in terms of sins in the past. Okay, so if you remember the story, <clears throat> when Amr embraced Islam, um, he went through that little ritual. He held out his hand uh, for the Prophet um, to pledge allegiance with him and the prophet held out his hand but Amr withdrew his hand and the prophet asked him why and he said um, I've got some conditions and he said the prophet said uh, what's the condition and he said um, uh, uh, I want you to forgive me you know because of the terrible things he did in the past uh, as an enemy of Islam um, and then uh, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said don't you know, Amr, that Islam erases everything before it? Okay, so it's, um, that was a very good story by which you know we can easily remember the answer to this question. Okay, all the past sins will be erased upon embracing Islam. Go to the next next one. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the interpretation of the meaning, say, O oh Muhammad, to the people, if you do love Allah, then follow me, Muhammad. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say will result in us loving him and his messenger? Allah ta'ala says in the interpretation of the meaning, say, O oh Muhammad, to the people, if Allah, then follow me, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say will result in us loving him and his messenger? Okay, mashallah, excellent answer there from uh, Tariq. Allah Ta'ala says he will love us and forgive us of our sins. Say, if you love Allah, then follow me. Allah will love you and forgive you of your sins. And Allah is most forgiving, most merciful from Surah Ali Imran. So he's quoted the verse there. Uh, Sister Layli, we will earn Allah's love and forgive us of our sins. Good answer. Sister Yasmin, Allah will love us and forgive us our sins. The same from Sister Malyun. Sister Awa, the same answer, and Sister Isra, his pleasure and his uh, forgiveness, but not really his pleasure, it's his love. We'll earn his love and forgive. And Sister Um Al here, it means Allah will love us and forgive us our sins, same answer. Okay, so mashallah, excellent job there. 
All right, I'll we'll move on to another one. Uh, oh, that's the end. Okay. Okay, so mashallah, very good job. Um, really happy with the response to the um, quiz today. Uh, it shows you're really concentrating on the topic, so that's a good sign. And um, today we've got some, you know, pretty good material as as well. Um, so, inshallah, this will give us inspiration. Um, do something towards uh, those benefits we talked about, um, and raise our iman and all of that. Okay, so we'll go on with today's um, class. Oh, mashallah. Wow, lots of people here. Okay. Um, so in the previous class, the first class of the series, we talked about um, the many benefits which can be derived from studying the life of the Prophet wasallam. So today we're going to just start off with all of these benefits in more detail, and then we'll move on to discuss the background history um, to the life of the Prophet wasallam. Um, right from the earliest times when Makkah was first inhabited. Uh, so the last benefit that we discussed was b uh, developing a Muslim identity. Um, this can be done in two ways. <clears throat> the first one, having a deep understanding of our history. The second one, being a part of the Ummah and caring about the Ummah. So just quickly in a bit of detail, but number one, having a strong knowledge of our Islamic history. Um, this is composed of the following. Firstly, um, uh, having knowledge of the lives of the prophets. This is most important because the prophets, they were the ones who were strongest in Iman. So these are the best um, uh, examples for us in terms of strength of faith to learn about the lives of the prophets of Allah. Second, uh, in the priority you know, list of um, uh, uh, not having knowledge of Islamic history is the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what we're going to go through here. The third um, in the order of priorities of gaining Islamic knowledge or knowledge of our history is the lives of the Sahaba, the lives of the companions, radiallahu anhum. The next one, just knowledge in general, and after that, the Muslim history after that. So that's our order of priorities of um, gaining knowledge of Islamic history. And when you develop an identity, um, you need to have an attachment with history because our history is our lifeline. We are an extension of an ummah. We're not all separated. We're not separated from our Islamic heritage. And we're a part of a glorious ummah that we need to know more about. The second of these two um, uh, things that we're talking about is developing a Muslim identity. Okay. Um, a part of the worldwide Muslim ummah, our local identity should not override our Muslim identity. So my ties with my country of birth should not override my Islamic identity. And this uh, nation state concept is what Islam came to abolish so that we have our loyalty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to our deen and we're a part of a worldwide ummah. Therefore, we need to study and we need to learn <clears throat> more about our Muslim brothers and sisters around the world. And whatever happens in every part of the Muslim world, it should concern me as if it's happening within my own house. So these are two important elements in building an identity. And a famous politician, he once said, to destroy a people, you must first sever their roots. But we don't want our roots to be severed. We want our roots to be deep. And studying the life of the Prophet wasallam is the most important thing that we can read in our history. Another benefit which can be derived from studying the life of the Prophet is that the life of the Prophet is a testimony to his prophethood. The greatest miracle of Muhammad is the Holy Quran and Muhammad 
had many other miracles, but just by studying his life of his prophethood. So there he was, a man who for 40 years, um, he was just leading a normal life. He did have very excellent morals and character during those first 40 years. But the prophet, he didn't show any like outward signs of um, uh, aspiration to power or influence or those kind of things. 40, the prophet brought about the greatest change that the world has ever seen, a miracle. So this man, he was illiterate, he couldn't read or write, and then he presents the world with the greatest book ever produced, and we could go on and on and on with those kind of attributes. The list of things that could only be explained if Muhammad وسلم, was a messenger of Allah who had divine help. Otherwise, otherwise it's impossible to explain. There's no except to admit that he was a prophet from Allah. It's impossible for a person to achieve what Muhammad achieved without being assisted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through revelation. So it's a testimony to his prophethood. So for the first 40 years, his life was normal like everybody else at that time. Then suddenly he is propelled into being a political leader, military leader, religious leader, head of a large household, lawmaker, teacher, imam, and so on. And all of this was done within a span of 23 years, which leads us to the final point in these benefits that we're studying the life of the great, we're studying the life of the greatest man ever to set foot on this earth. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the greatest in that respect. And whatever benchmark you want to use for greatness, he would still come out on top. So we're studying the life of Al-Mustafa. Mustafa, it means the one who was chosen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him. Al-Mustafa, Al-Khalqi, he's the chosen one out of all creation of Allah. So they are some of the benefits that we've gone through, which result from intensive study of the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And... Um, in this session and the next, before we deal directly with his life, uh, we're going to come. Uh, we're going to cover over some of the background history. Okay, so that's today and in the next uh, presentation, inshallah. Okay, so we will just get started here on the background history. Um, often, when scholars um, write about Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They don't start with his birth, but rather they would start way before that with, for example, the story of Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam, Hajar and Ismail. Ibrahim, alayhi salam, his wife and his newborn son, they traveled to present day Makkah. At that time, it was just a dead valley. And Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he left his wife and son Ismail there, along with some water and a bag of dates, and then he walked away. Hajar knew that Ibrahim was going to leave them, but she didn't expect him to leave her in such a place in the middle of the desert. So she followed him and she said, Ibrahim, are you going to leave us in a place where there is no cultivation and there was nobody living here? Ibrahim, he didn't answer back. And she, so she asked him again, he didn't answer. She asked a third time, he didn't answer. And then Hajar said, did Allah Ta'ala tell you to do so? Ibrahim said, yes. So she said, then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will take care of us. Allah will not neglect us. So Hajar was saying that if this was a command of Allah Ta'ala, then she had trust in him, even if that meant living in the middle of nowhere. Ibrahim alayhi salam left. And when he reached a place where he couldn't be, he couldn't see them anymore. He turned around and he faced the direction of the Kaaba and he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as in Surah Ibrahim. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Rabbana inni askantu wa min durriyyati ki bi wadin ghayri zi zar'in inda bayti kalamu harrami ga rabbana rabbana tu
la'allahum yashkurun. Our Lord, I have settled some of my descendants in an uncultivated valley near your sacred house, our Lord, that they may establish prayer. So make hearts among the people and climb towards them and provide for them from the fruits that they may be grateful. So modern man has a hierarchy of needs based on a foundation of physiological needs. So firstly, he wants to fulfill his physical needs. Then in order comes the social needs, a social life. And then after that, he wants to have faith, to believe in something. And then finally, self-actualization, self-realization, um, which refers to achieving your full potential in life or understanding yourself or, or that kind of thing. But not according to Prophet Ibrahim, salam. he wouldn't have any of that. The opposite, in fact. So Prophet Ibrahim, salam, for him, the hierarchy is now upside down. So the first thing he asks for in Surah Ibrahim is the Mustara, that they may establish prayer. The first thing he mentioned was the spiritual needs. And then he said, make hearts among the people and climb towards them. And then he asked for love for them to be put in in the hearts of the people so this was for his family's social needs and finally he asked for their physical needs provide for them from the fruits but even when he asked Allah Ta'ala to give them fruits he connected it with worship and he said that they might be grateful and Prophet Ibrahim he then left his wife Hajra made use of the small amount of food left with them, but obviously after a short while they ran out of food. Hajra was breastfeeding Ismail and her milk was drying up because she was thirsty and hungry. Ismail then began to cry due to hunger. Hajra couldn't bear seeing her baby crying in pain, so she left him in search of food. She started climbing a hill, which was later called Astafa. She climbed and looked all around uh, to see if she could see anybody. So she climbed down the hill, and when she reached the valley, she tucked up her clothes and ran, and then climbed another hill, which was later called Al Marwa. When she reached the top again, she looked all around to see if she could find anyone. Her son was twisting and turning in pain while Haja was running up and down these, these hills, and she did that seven times. Seventh time, she reached the top of the hill, and then she heard a sound. She turned around and to see. Uh, where the sound was coming from, and to her amazement, she saw that that sound was coming from beneath the feet of her son Ismail, alayhi salam. The angel Jibril, alayhi salam, had descended and dug the well of Zamzam. The water was coming out beneath her, his feet, and Hajar rushed in happiness to the source of the water because the desert was obviously very dry, and then she made a pool to contain the water, and fearing that the water would be absorbed by the desert, desert sands. The Prophet said when he was narrating this story to his companions, he said, May Allah Ta'ala have mercy on the mother of Ismail. If she had left the water alone, it would have been a flowing river. If she'd have left the miracle without interfering, it would have been a river flowing with fresh water. But what Hajra was feeling when she was running up and down those hills what is that her heart must have been broken. She might have been crying because of the pain and the suffering of her son in front of her eyes. Hajar was a righteous woman, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was testing her, and he had hidden for her something of the future. So not knowing what will happen next, next she must have been in real pain. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when he was mentioning the story of Hajar going up and down as Safa and Marwa, and that is why we go between as Safa and Marwa. So we are following in the footsteps of Hajar until this day. If Hajar knew that a time would come when the people would arrive from all around the world in millions to follow her footsteps, she would have run up and down as Safa and Marwa with a big smile on her face. So we need to realize that at times we're put through very difficult times, but we don't really know what Allah Ta'ala has in store for us. We get a into difficult situations when that happens let us remember that Hajar went through this and because of her tawakkul her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala she was provided with something much better 
since there was now water in the desert, that meant it would surely attract other forms of life. So birds began to hover over the well, and there was this tribe called Jorhum, who were nomads of that particular area. Jorhum was a tribe that had moved out of Yemen, and many different people migrated out of Yemen at different times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us one of the stories in the Holy Quran of a kingdom called Saba. The people of Saba were the first to build a dam. And because of that dam, they had year-round supplies of water, in spite of the fact that there was very little rain in the Arabian Peninsula. But the dam stored water, which could be used year-round. The kingdom of Saba grew to such huge numbers of people due to this water supply in the middle of the Arabian desert. desert. And it's mentioned in the Holy Quran that because of their wealth and cultivation, they didn't really feel any hardship associated or usually associated with traveling in the desert. So they had this, like a continuous series of colonies, which meant abundant places to rest and eat for travelers across the desert. But because of their disobedience towards Allah Ta'ala's message, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala destroyed their dam, which flooded a vast expanse across Yemen. So as a result, there was a huge emigration out of Yemen, and this forced the people of Yemen into all those other areas like a nudged Al Hijaz, Iraq, Sham, and Medina, and so on. So, Jurhum, too, was one of those tribes that ended up moving out of Yemen into Hijaz or the area. Jurhum were familiar with the area of Makkah and they knew that there was no other water in that area. So, when they saw birds hovering in the sky, they wondered what was going on there. So, they sent some people to investigate the matter. And they returned with the news that there was a well there. Jorhum went into the area where Zamzam is located, and they asked Hajar a strange question. And they got an even more strange answer. They asked, can we settle in this place? And the reason this question was strange is because we're talking about a tribe of warriors. And they were asking permission from this lonely woman who was with her small child. So they could have just pushed her out of the way, but they asked her politely. And she responded, well, if you want to stay, I have one condition, and that is that the water belongs to us. So she, being a lonely woman with no protection whatsoever, is negotiating a situation in which she could have been kicked out, but she couldn't have done, and she couldn't have done anything about that. And then they agreed. And the Prophet wasallam said, when telling the story, deep in her heart, she wanted them to stay. So she wanted to have company, but she just wanted to get a better deal. So they stayed in the place that became, uh, became known as Makkah, and Ismail salam, grew up with them, and he adopted their language, the Arabic language, because Ibrahim, um, his father was from Iraq, and they used to speak a different language in Iraq at that time. Then Ismail, he married a woman from that tribe. So this was the beginning of the lineage of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, the tribe of Jurhum, they had political leadership in Makkah. And later on, Prophet Ibrahim, he came back and he built the Kaaba with Ismail. And the religious leadership in Makkah was then with uh, Ismail and it continued alongside with his descendants. So Jurhum, they never had any religious authority in or over the Kaaba. Jurhum stayed in Makkah for a very long time until they became corrupt and tyrannical. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Khuza'a tribe upon them. Khuza'a kicked them out of Makkah, and Khuza'a was another tribe that left Yemen and entered Hijaz or the Makkah region, kicking out the Jurhum tribe. Before Jurhum left, they did two things. They covered over the well of Zamzam and they erased all of its markings. Secondly, they stole the treasures which were inside the Kaaba. Khuza'a now became the new leaders in Makkah, while the descendants of Ismail, by that time they'd already increased in number, branched out and spread all over the Arabian Peninsula. But there was one branch that remained in Makkah and that branch was Quraysh. So Quraysh was one, of the, uh, was one of the many different tribes who descended from Ismail. Uh, so the Quraysh, who was living in Mecca, however, they were ruled by Khuza'a. One of the leaders of Khuza'a 
was a man called Amr bin Luhay al Khuzai. The head of Quraysh, Qusay bin Kilab, was able to unify the Quraysh and lead a revolt against Khuzai tribe. He was able to drive them completely out of Makkah, and for the first time, all powers, including political and religious, were under the authority of Qusay. He controlled the guardianship of the Kaaba and he controlled the distribution of food and water to the pilgrims. It may sound a trivial point, but for them it was considered a great honor to provide food and water to the guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what this responsibility meant was that all other Arabs who came for the pilgrimage would be hosted by the people of Quraysh. He also had control over Nadwa, which was the assembly of Quraysh. It was like their parliament. Hussein also controlled the banner of war. In other words, he was the one who had the power to declare war. So these were the powers that Hussein bin Kilab had as the absolute ruler of Mecca. When Hussein bin Kilab died, these different types of authorities were split amongst his children. The grandson of Hussein was called Amr. And he ended up inheriting from his father the provisions of al hujjaj in other words, providing the pilgrims with food and drink. Amr did something new in feeding the hujjaj Rather than providing them with soup, he started crushing bread into the soup. So the food had gotten better. Now, the process of crushing in Arabic, it's called Hashim. So he was nicknamed Hashim. And this was the great-grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Hashim, he married in Al Medina. Then he went to Palestine for business, where later on he died and was buried in Gaza. His wife became pregnant and she gave birth to a child named Sheba. Sheba in Arabic means old man. So why would anybody call their child old man? It's because he was born with some gray hair and so the name. His mother stayed with her parents in Medina because the child's father had passed away and Sheba was brought up by the family in Medina. One day a man entered Medina and his name was Al-Muttalib. Al-Muttalib is Hashim's brother. Al-Muttalib went to claim custody of, his, of him saying that he wanted to because Sheba was living in Medina. Sheba was around eight years old but the mother refused to give him up. Al-Muttalib finally convinced the family to give up Sheba by saying that he belonged to the noblest family of Quraysh. And now he has to go back and learn about his heritage, his family, and start assuming responsibilities in Makkah. Eventually, they agreed to this. Al-Muttalib, he entered Makkah with this child before. In those days, slave shopping was very common. You just go out and buy a slave. And since this boy was new, the people assumed that he was a slave of Al-Muttalib, so they called him Abdul Muttalib. And this is the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His real name is Sheba, but they thought he was a slave, so they called him Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, now, um, to this point, uh, the well of Zamzam, it had been had it been unknown for about 300 years or so, ever since Jurahum had filled it up and erased all the markings of it. Then uh, Abdul Muttalib, he saw a dream. Somebody came to him in the dream and he said, they said, dig Taiba. Taiba means pure. Abdul Muttalib responded in his dream and he said, what is Taiba? He didn't get any reply. And that was the end of the dream. Following night, the same voice came and told him in his dream, Dig the precious. Abu Muttalib said, what is the precious? He didn't get any reply. The third night, the voice came to him and said, dig Zamzam. Abu Muttalib said, what is Zamzam? The voice responded, Zamzam, it will never fail or dry up and it will water the grand pilgrims. It lies between the dung and the blood near the nest of the crow with the white leg and the ant's nest. Abdul Muttalib was unable to decode all of these symbols, which seemed very obscure to him. The next day, Abdul Muttalib, he was going around the Kaaba and he saw some dung and blood. There was a camel that was slaughtered in that place and they left its insides and the blood on the outside. Then he saw a crow with a white leg in the same area 
and there was a colony of ants. Abu Muttalib realized that this is where the well of his grandfather is. So he called his son Harith and they started digging. The well of Zamzam is not very far from the Kaaba. So when the people saw them, they said, what are you doing? Why are you digging next to the Kaaba? People kept on protesting, but he and his son Al Harith, they kept on digging. They kept on digging and digging and the people kept on protesting and protesting. And they couldn't understand why he was doing this. And eventually they left him alone. In a while, they heard Abdul Muttalib shout and he was praising Allah to Allah. The people came rushing out and to their amazement, Muttalib had uncovered the rim of the well of Zamzam. All of the leaders of Quraysh came out and they said, this is the well of our grandfather Ismail. So what they meant was that the well belonged to all of them, so they should share it. Abdul Muttalib said, I was the one who saw the dream. I was the one who uncovered it. It belongs to me and me alone. They refused, saying that they are all descendants, of Islam, so it belongs to all of them. Abdul Muttalib, he refused to give it up, but they kept on insisting. When they were unable to solve the dispute and were about to start fighting over it, somebody suggested, let's solve the dispute by going to the witch of Banu Sa'ad. Banu Sa'ad had a witch who claimed to have connection with the spirits, so they went to consult her. They traveled to this witch and they were told that she had moved and gone to Syria. When they started their journey towards Syria, they ran out of water. So they were there in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, and so Abdul Muttalib told them, if we're going to die here, let's at least dig our graves. And whenever one of us dies, the rest could put him in the grave and cover him. So at least in the end, we'll be left with one person uncovered rather than have all of us die exposed. So they all dug their own graves and they were waiting inside their graves, waiting for death. Then Abdul Muttalib said, this isn't right for men like us to wait for death. So let's do something. Let's go and search for water. They agreed and they went in different directions in search of water. After a short while, Abdul Muttalib found water. And so they came to him and said, if Allah Ta'ala has saved you in this desert and provided you with water, and Allah has shown you in a dream in which you uncovered the well of Zamzam, this is surely an indication that it's a blessing for you and it belongs to you. We'll give up our claim. It's all yours. Let's go back. Now, before this incident happened, uh, and they all pressured him to share the well of Zamzam, Abdul Muttalib, he felt very weak because he had only one son to defend him. And in tribal societies in that time, your strength, it was based on how many men you had on your side. So you, you could only really count on your relatives, like your sons, brothers and uncles and so on. So Abdul Muttalib said, oh, Allah Ta'ala, if you give me 10 sons, I will sacrifice one of them for your sake. Then did bless him with 10 sons and six daughters. Then it was time for him to fulfill his promise to Allah Ta'ala. And they had these arrows next to Hubal, their large idol. And they believed that these arrows were divine. So Abdul Muttalib, he had the names of all of his sons on these arrows, and it came on his son Abdullah. He did it a second time, and it came on Abdullah. A third time, it came on Abdullah. So Abdul Muttalib, he took Abdullah with him next to the Kaaba, and then he was ready with a knife to slaughter him. Abu Talib, one of the elder sons of Abdul Muttalib, went to his father and he said, we can't allow you to kill your son. And then the, uh, the maternal relatives of Abdullah, they came out and said, we're not going to allow you to kill our son. People were coming and telling Abdul Muttalib, if you do it, then we will become, well, this will become the custom for the Arabs after you. So Abdul Muttalib, if he did something, it would become a custom after that. Abdul Muttalib said, it was a pledge that I made to Allah Ta'ala, and I cannot give it up. So this ended up in a dispute. So how could they resolve the issue? They decided to go to that witch. So they went to the witch and told her the situation. She said, all right, come back to me tomorrow so that I can consult my spirits. They came back the next day. Then she had an answer for them. She said, what is the retribution that you pay to a person who was killed? They said 10 camels. She said, then put 10 camels on one side, put Abdullah on the other side, and cast arrows. If it points towards the camels, slaughter the camels. If it points towards Abdullah, then add another 10 camels. 
So they agreed, they went back, they did exactly what the witch said. The arrow pointed towards Abdullah, they added another 10 camels, it pointed towards Abdullah again, and the number of camels increased all the way up to 100 and towards the camels. People of Quraysh said, finally, we can release your son. Abdullah Muttalib said, not yet. We've got to do it one more time. So they did it another time and another two more times, and it was consistently pointing towards the camels. So they slaughtered 100 camels and he had to pay for all of it. And Abdul Muttalib, he was a very generous man. He refused to take any of that meat for himself. He gave it out, he gave it away, and there was took so much, but there was still enough to feed the birds and the beasts. Later on, it became famous among the Arabs that Abdul Muttalib, he was the one who fed the humans and the animals, and he is the one who even fed the birds in the sky. Now the people of the Quraysh, they were right when they told Abdul Muttalib that if he killed his son, it would become a tradition among the Arabs after him. Because when he sacrificed 100 camels for his son, the blood changed from 10 camels to 100 camels. And this tradition was kept and reserved by Islam, even though today it isn't given in camels, the blood money is given in actual currency and money. So the blood money still today is 100 camels, However, it's calculated in terms of currency. And Abdullah and Amina are the parents of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And later on, they would tell him the story that you are the son of the two sacrificed ones. And who are they? Ismail and Abdullah. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Okay, that's the end of today's session. And um, inshallah, we're going to spend just one more session dealing with this background history, okay, leading up to the birth of the Prophet Wasallam, And these are the events um, which uh, go up to the year in which the Prophet was born and the year of the elephant. Um, so one of the stories, one of the very moving stories next time uh, is the people of the ditch, the magician, the monk, and the boy. Okay, a very moving story next time, inshallah, which will be in your time zone uh, Monday, Monday next week. Okay, so uh, we'll stop at that point. If there are any questions relating to the material we've discussed today, anything you want to clarify, because we will do another quiz next week, okay? on. Um, on today's class, we'll do a quiz next week. Okay, so do try to study this, and um, if the if the video is uh, put on Facebook or something, do just try and go over that a second time because you gain a lot of knowledge by going over something twice. Okay, and uh, if you play the video back or something, uh, you can take your time and uh, um, uh, just do the uh, what we've gone through today, inshallah. Okay, any questions, type them on the screen or use the mic if you want. Well, you're welcome. Assalamualaikum. I just like have a statement. Can I be heard? Yes, go ahead, sister. Sister. Uh, Brother Muhammad, that that yeah, sounded get, similar on. to uh, that sounded similar to like what Abraham did to his son. How he was going to sacrifice him. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So this is the reason why, right at the end, um, I mentioned how um, uh, 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 the, uh, the, yeah, the the parents of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abdullah and Amina, 
um, this is why they um, this is why they told him the story uh, that you are the son of the two sacrificed ones, Ismail and Abdullah. So Ismail um, being the son of Ibrahim, and uh, that's a separate story of um, when he was going to sacrifice him, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced him, him with a, a ram, and so he slaughtered the ram uh, instead. So that's the way now of the, of the two sacrificed ones. That's why they called him that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got some more questions here on the screen. Uh, just scroll down along here. Um, uh, yeah, some of the questions are going a bit off the topic, but uh, we'll have a go here. Uh, just hang on, changing my screens over. Yeah, so you might have picked up from the class that um, uh, the people at that at that time um, they were involved in all kinds of superstitions and all kinds of um, uh, shirk and all this kind of stuff. Um, so they know, they were not practicing like Tawhid at that time. The majority of the people then. Okay, so um, so this is what happens throughout history, that you know they had a prophet, prophet Ismail, and um, they have some followers, and many people, of course, uh, just refused to follow those teachings, uh, which was common in the society at that time because their superstitions and all their shirk and all of that were very steadfast. And it was hard for them to give up those kind of things. That's why when you move forward in time and you come to the Quraysh, that's why they um, very, very strongly resisted um, uh, the teachings of the Prophet because so, they had, you know, uh, all those um, decades and decades and, you know, previous uh, family history of following those um, ignorant practices and uh, we talked about this a lot in the in the um, in the Tajweed class when we talked about the tafsir in Surat at Tawbah, and uh, it talked uh, a large amount, you know, about the characteristics of um, the disbelievers and the hypocrites. So it went into that a lot. Okay, so when that has happened throughout history. Basically, it just calls for the need of another prophet, and this is how we had successive prophets from Ibn Ismail and so on up to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi was the last of the prophets to bring the people back to the truth. Okay. Another question here: um, Do we have to quote the Quran and Hadith exactly how it's written, or can we paraphrase? Um, uh as for the quran um we can i mean we don't all speak arabic to start with okay but because we don't all speak arabic it shouldn't be like a stumbling block that you can't learn islam okay because if you don't speak arabic it doesn't matter you can still learn in uh the meaning of the verses in your own language and that's fine um so if you're going to quote the Quran in the English meaning, you stay at you just stay. Sorry, getting my tongue twisted. You just say uh, at the start in the interpretation of the meaning because Allah didn't actually say that in English. 
he said it in Arabic language. Um, so because if we don't know Arabic, we just say in the interpretation of the meaning, and then you say the meaning in English, that's fine. Um, now about paraphrasing, um, there's nothing wrong with paraphrasing as long as you state the verse to start with exactly as it is. Um, but to get the meaning across a lot better in today's modern language, that's fine to paraphrase. As long as you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and the interpretation of the meaning so and so and so and so and so and so, and then you can paraphrase to expand the meaning to get it more into context with today's language so that people can actually understand you. Other than the old fashioned language that you see uh, interpreted in some of some versions of the of the Quran. And the second point about the hadith, um, yeah, the same thing goes. Um, you quote the hadith, say it exactly as the prophet said it, and uh, giving the a translation in English, of course. Um, but it's okay to paraphrase it. In other words, um, to use words that people can commonly understand. And you know, this is one of the um, uh, the wonderful things I found with like many many years ago when I first came here, is that um, uh, especially Sister Layla, she will un explain things that everyone can understand. And this is from the Sunnah because this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did. When a Bedouin Arab came off, off the stinking hot desert, you know, all disheveled and dirty and all of that, and he spoke to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he could understand his instantly. He knew exactly what he was talking about. And this is how we need to be today, to explain things in the common language so that everyone can understand. Okay, so I hope that makes the point. Oh uh, yeah, sometimes I just know, carry on, but um, Oh uh, yeah, my sister, you are doing very well in the quizzes. Um, so that's that's fine. Alhamdulillah. Any more questions? Assalamu alaikum. Um, is, uh, is this uh, class only going to be given every Monday and Wednesday? Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, it's on Mondays and Wednesdays. We'll just try it out at the moment uh, two days a week because there's a lot of information here and it might, if we have many more classes, it might be a bit uh, too much, I'm not sure. But next week we'll have two classes and we'll see how we go. Inshallah.